Hey friends, Heather here. I am so excited because today we are going to dig in to my book, The Burden of Better. Whether you've read it or not, it doesn't matter, although this will be better if you've read it. <laughs> but even if you haven't, I still hope you'll listen in because first of all, I think you may want to read it after you listen. But second, I think that there's a message for every woman. And hey, if you're a guy listening to I'm going to include you in this, but every one of us who struggles with comparison, and that's really what this book is about. As I looked around and read different books on comparison, I didn't feel like I was getting any answers that were meaty enough to really set me free, and that was my heart behind writing this book. So I really hope that you enjoy today's first book club session. So we're going to do one of these every month. The last episode of every month will be this book club kind of episode just through the spring, just three times. And we're going to go through Burden of Better. So if you don't have a copy of the book yet, go grab one. And I would love for you to send me questions. Email me, heather at compared to who.me. Drop me a message and say, Heather, hey, I read this. I'm struggling. What am I supposed to do with this? or how does this look in my life, drop me a question and I would love to answer it in the next round of our book club, which will happen at the end of March. So I hope you enjoy today's conversation about the first part of The Burden of Better. Welcome to Compare to Who, the podcast to help you make peace with your body so you can savor God's rest and feel his love. If you're tired of fighting body image the world's way, Compare to Who is the show for you. You've likely heard lots of talk about loving your body, but my goal is different. Striving to fall in love with stretch marks and cellulite is a little silly to me. Instead, I want to encourage you and remind you with the truth of scripture that you are seen, you are known, and you are loved no matter what your size or shape. Here the pressure is off. If you're looking for real talk, biblical encouragement, and regular reminders that God loves you and you're not alone, you've come to the right place. I hope you enjoy today's show and hey, tell a friend about it. Hey, hey there, friends. I am so glad that you are tuning in for this important conversation about comparison by way of looking at the first part of my latest book, The Burden of Better, How a Comparison-Free Life Leads to Joy, Peace, and Rest. Now, first, let me tell you, all you have to do is go on my website and the introduction and chapter one are there for free. So just go to comparedo.me slash books, look for Burden of Better, and there's a little spot where you can start reading now. And you can start reading this first two chapters, essentially, for free free. I would love for you to do that. But whenever I do an interview about this book, I get asked about the acknowledgement. And so I thought I would just read it for you. I don't think you can see it when you download the free sample of the book. So I'll read it for you. It says to every woman young or advanced in years who through the common act of comparing herself to another woman has ever felt compelled, pressured, forced, driven, obliged, required, urged, or prompted to be better. Friends, that is why I wrote this book because I feel like all day long, every day, I am encountering ads, television shows, people's expectations, my own voices in my head, all of these things around me are pressuring me to be better. And you can make the case, right, that it's not a bad thing to want to be better. And I talk about this, I think it's in chapter three, right? It, it's not bad to want to improve, but here's what I think happens. I think we become better seekers instead of Jesus seekers. I think we become better chasers instead of Jesus chasers. And it's somewhat nuanced and then somewhat not, right? Because of course, it feels like maybe I could do both, right? I don't know about you, but I'd like to be a multitasker. Can I chase Jesus and self-improvement at the same time? 
And I think it gets a little tricky because, yes, of course, there is a way that God wants us to grow and improve. But sometimes, and I know you're listening because you think a lot like me, sometimes we get stuck trying to improve in these ways that really don't have a whole lot to do with our spiritual journey. In fact, I might dare say they conflict with our spiritual journey. So I was thinking about this today, and this isn't necessarily in the book. This is kind of an addition, a behind-the-scenes thought (laughs) to the book, if you will. But I was thinking about the reality that I think I'm an okay wife, like maybe even a good wife, but I could probably be a better wife. Uh, I don't iron my husband's shirts. Uh, Sorry, I just don't. I don't like to iron. He has to wear an ironable shirt most days of the week, and I don't iron them. Um, I do make dinner. But I don't make breakfast on Saturdays, never, not once. <laughs> um, well, actually, I did once, and that didn't go well. And so I didn't do it ever again. And, and that's probably another reason why I could be a better wife, because I'm still hanging on to that pancake argument we had 17 years ago. Uh, he didn't like the texture of my pancakes. Anyway, that's a, that's a whole other story. But there are ways that I know that I could be a better wife. But here's what's interesting. I don't obsess over that. I don't spend the quiet time in my head think, well, there is no quiet time in my head, but I don't spend moments of peace and quiet thinking and strategizing about ways I could be a better wife. My Google search history will show that I don't think I've Googled how to be a better wife once in the last year or two years or three years. I've been married almost 18 years now. Maybe I Googled it early on, but I can pretty much guarantee you for the last decade, I've never Googled that. I'm not obsessed with trying to be a better wife, but where I can be obsessed is with trying to have a better body, trying to lose weight, trying to change my shape, trying to firm the parts. Those things, my friend, especially over the last decade, I've been changing in this arena a lot, but you'll find those things in my search history if you go back far enough, (laughs) right? If you could see my thoughts like a movie screen, you'd see that they go there sometimes. Now, I've gotten so much better. God has helped me so much with learning how to take thoughts captive, learning how to defeat my body image idol, all these things, right? But that's still a battle that wages within me that I have to fight regularly. And so as I was thinking about my book, The Burden of Better, the ways we compare ourselves to other people, I am not often tempted to compare what kind of wife I am to, you know, how I see another woman treating her husband. I'm not often going to be like, oh, she's such a good wife. Why can't I be that good of a wife? Like, that's just not an area of temptation or struggle for me. But, (laughs) oh, she's so fit. Oh, she's got that shape I want. She wears that size I want. That is an area that I am tempted to compare myself in. And so as we think about this concept of better, right, and chasing better, in some ways it may be a good thing or a God-honoring thing for me to chase better in the how to be a better wife arena. Now, certainly not if my motivation is to, you know, be better because I want to be better than someone else, right? If it's if the heart is comparison, which is really envy, and we'll talk about that in just a second, if that's the heart behind it, then that's probably not a good thing. But in terms of the tasks that God has called me to, right? Being a good wife to my husband is a task that if I put energy and effort into that, right? Like with God as my helper, Jesus standing beside me, helping me every step of the way, becoming a good wife, that is a noble God honoring purpose right? That is a biblically ordained purpose that I have because I am married. And all you single ladies, there there might be something else out there for you that applies in the same way. But this is a God-ordained purpose. Trying to be hotter, trying to look better in my genes, 
I hate to say it, friends, but that's not quite the same, <laughs> right? So as we think about this burden of better. I think the first thing to recognize is this is not a burden that God puts on us. This is a burden that we choose to carry for ourselves. And oh, friends, it's deep, right? Like none of us are just like, yeah, I'm bored. I'm just going to pick up this issue and carry it around. Like that is not the way this happens, right? It's normally part of our story, some part of our family of origin, some, some thing that has happened to us or thing that we've experienced that we haven't maybe processed all the way or haven't sat in long enough to grieve or haven't maybe gone work through the trauma with someone, right? Like, like there's all different ways we can experience healing from these things that impact us from, from our childhood or teenage years or, you know, whenever in our life we experience them. But we decide based on these experiences, what burdens of better we want to prioritize what burdens of better we want to keep carrying around with us. And and really, you guys aren't going to be surprised by the punchline here. And it's one of the punchlines in the book. But a lot of the times, these burdens that we carry are related to our ideals. Okay. Now, what is an ideal? An ideal is I have this picture in my head of the kind of wife I think I should be, the kind of mom I think I should be, the kind of woman I think I should be. Maybe it's age related. You know, at 30, I am supposed to be this, this, and this, or I was supposed to be this, this, and this at 30, or I was supposed to have accomplished this and had this thing by 40, or, you know, but at 50, I was still going to look like this and my life was going to be this, right? So there's all these different pictures in our heads that, again, we've been painting colors on, developing (laughs) since we were children, chances are. And these things become our ideals, right? This is the me that I should be. And it was kind of an interesting place to go for this Burden of Better book, right? Because it's a book about comparison. And I think most of the time we think about comparison, we think about comparing ourselves to other people, right? Like I want to be more like her or she's super successful. I want to be successful like she is, like those kind of things. But I think the area where most of us struggle and don't even recognize the struggle is with comparison is when we start comparing the real us to the ideal me, right? Who should I be? And then we had all this pressure, right? And so I talk in the book about how I really thought I was going to be the mom who made like homemade chicken nuggets and who fed her children organic, healthy foods, right? And part of this, just if I'm being honest, part of this was because of my health idol, my body image idol, right? Like maybe my children would never struggle with their bodies if they only ate healthy organic foods. That would just fix everything magically, you know? Okay, never mind that it might give them orthorexia. Um, <laughs> when they saw their first Oreo, they would eat the whole thing, <laughs> the whole package. But but aside from that, now these are these expectations that I had for myself as a mom. And in my head, I determined what would be failure and what would be success based on, and follow me here, not based on what God says success and failure are as a mom, but based on my ideals. And so y'all, every single time I would hear my kids open the packaged potato chips or the packaged granola bars, every single time I heard that noise, it was a little mom fail. It was, oh, I failed. I'm not the kind of mom I thought I was going to be. Why can't I just be more like that mom that I knew I should be? If I were a good mom, my kids would be eating organic snacks that, you know, I freshly prepared for them. All of these sort of ridiculous things, but I was totally in bondage to this ideal me. (laughs) 
Oh, hey friend, there's two opportunities I wanna make sure you know about today. Number one is our brand new Patreon community. Go to patreon.com slash compared to who, and you can find all different levels to support this show. Hey, straight up, I really appreciate your support. I have quit my day job, and I am trying to make compared to who my full-time ministry, and so I appreciate any amount of support you can give to the show there. And to bless you in return, I am recording some bonus episodes, putting more content in there. We're going to have monthly meetings at certain Patreon levels. I'm even giving away some extra coaching at certain levels of sponsorship. So go check out patreon.com slash compared to who and find out if maybe that is a community you should be involved in. Also, coaching is open. One of the biggest joys of my life is to help women walk out of body image issues and into freedom, you are worth investing in. Chances are you have spent thousands of dollars on the diets, on the weight loss supplements, on all the things. Why not try a couple hours of coaching and see if you can find freedom? We can do a free 10-minute call and find out if you like working with me and if coaching would be right for you. So go to compare to me slash coaching and you can find out how to grab that 10-minute call or get set up with your first appointment today because I want to see you experience real freedom in Christ in this arena. And so as I was writing the book, I realized that perhaps my biggest struggle with comparison is really comparing me to my ideal. And I wanted to dig in to figure out what that was. Why do I get stuck there? Why do so many people I know get stuck there? And friends, like sometimes I'm not like the authors of the Bible in any way, like do not misinterpret what I'm going to say here. But sometimes I think with my fingers as I'm writing and it just kind of came out. (laughs) It was our ideals are our idols. And I typed it. I don't, you know, I don't know where it came from. I mean, I'm assuming that, that the Lord guided me in this, but I was like, our ideals are idols. Yes. That's it. Because back to what I was saying initially, if I had an idol of how to be a good wife or a good wife idol, I don't know. That's a weird idol name. (laughs) Maybe there's a better way to capture that. But if, if being a good wife was something that I put on the pedestal, that I valued, that I treasured, that I thought was super important to my identity, really, because that's what it comes down to. If I thought that was super important to my identity, A good wife makes breakfast on Saturday mornings. A good wife, you know, whatever you would add to that list, right? Then that becomes the list of basically things I have to check off each day or each week to consider myself a good wife in order to make who happy? I don't, my husband's not asking for this. In order to make what happy? I, I think it comes down to this is what I would need to do in order to make that idol happy, right? In order to satisfy those ideals. And really, you know, maybe y'all, even underneath that, it's really to make myself happy, right? Because whose rules are these? Whose list is this? It's my list. There's not a list where you can go on Google and say, uh, you know, what, what are the characteristics of a good wife and print this thing out and that's, and he has any kind of authority, right? Like there's truth in scripture about what a good wife does, but even there, there's a freedom, right? There's not specific rules. A good wife has to work this many hours a week, but, but make sure she's always home on Friday afternoons to take care of her husband's laundry. It's like nothing like that at all, right? We have so much freedom within the boundaries of, of how the Bible describes a good wife, right? She's faithful. She submits to her husband. And that could be a whole episode on in, in and of itself. But there's not just one way to be a good wife. A good wife doesn't have a certain personality. And a good wife doesn't have to look a certain way, right? There's so many different ways that the parameters of scripture allow us to be a good wife. Now, I'm sorry, my single friends, if you're not married and you're listening to this, this illustration may not ring home as much, but but apply this to anything, right? And so let's go to your body image, right? There's, there's so many different ways that we can serve 
God. So many different things he has given us to do, purpose, a purpose he has for us, right? But he doesn't say we have to do it wearing a certain size clothing, <laughs> right? Like that's just not there. And so going back to these ideals and these idols we have, friends, it's our ideals that become our idols. And that's where we get stuck, not only serving the body image idol or the good wife idol or the successful um, employee idol or whatever idol you may come up with, right? Not just serving those idols, but friends also kind of serving the idol of self, right? Ultimately, who am I trying to please through my betterment, right? Who do I want to be better for? Do I want to be better for you? <laughs> do I want to be better for Jesus? Or do I want to be better for me? And I'm just going to be honest with you guys. That's my MO. Most of my life I've spent trying to be better for you and for me, right? Those two things take priority or have taken priority over wanting to be better in a way that Jesus prescribes, which is really a pressure off kind of way, right? His burden is light. His yoke is easy. God is not glomming things onto us. Come on, you can do a little bit better. Oh, you got four B's. And five A's, let's make it nine A's next time. Like, that's not how God is looking at our life. It's not a giant report card where he's hoping we can bring all our grades up across all the subjects. It's not that at all, friends. And so that, that was my heart behind writing this book. So if you started reading chapter one in the introduction, I talk about just all the different ways I have tried to compete Okay. Oh, I hate using that word. It's so embarrassing. But I think you know it's true, right? Like, I just remember taking my kids to play group one time. And my we had four kids in just about four years, no twins. And so I had a bunch of little kids every time someone invited us someplace. I just had a little, a little gaggle of young children. And I remember we were with a bunch of people, a b- bunch of kids. I mean, just we're talking probably 20 kids. And a fight broke out over, I think it was goldfish or something, but a fight broke out. (laughs) And my son, he was first born. Okay, this is, he's a rules guy. We had him roughing soccer by the time he was age 12 because he's such a rules guy. But my son like stopped and told these little kids, he's like, hey, you guys need to share. And I think he may have quoted Daniel Tiger in there. Like you can take a turn and then you get it back. But he's like, you need to share. Jesus wants us to share. And I was like, yeah, hello, look at the mom, whose kid is that? Oh, it's, it's my kid. Wow. What a great mom he must have, (laughs) you know? And of course I said none of this out loud, y'all, but you know, in my brain, I am swelling with pride over this shining mom moment. Like, well, at least I'm doing something right (laughs) because my kid knows about sharing. Okay. That that's like, one minute out of a million, right? And I'm sure as soon as we got home that day, my kids were fighting over something and not remembering to share. But isn't that what comparison does to us? It puts us in these little competitions. I call it like the Olympic Games. And we just had the Olympics in real life here. Um, I, I love the Olympics, but it was like my own personal Olympics. Like I had to win every event. And so when that happened, I was winning in the playgroup moms, like, you know, gold medal for teaching your child to sharing event. Right. But there's all these different arenas that we feel pressure to compete. Like, how do I look at church on Sunday morning? Ugh. That's a yucky one, right? Am I going to church on Sunday morning so that people will look and be like, wow, Heather looks great today? Or am I going to church on Sunday mornings to praise the Lord and shine the light on him, right? Like who do I want the spotlight to shine on when I'm at church on Sunday mornings? Do I want it to shine on me or do I want it to shine on him, right? So I explore some of those kind of things early in the book. And then 
I get into just this reality of we have a lot of cliches that we talk about when we talk about comparison, right? Comparison is the thief of joy. And don't compare your behind the scenes to someone else's highlights reel. Have you heard that one? I think it's Stephen Fiertek that said it. And regardless of what you think of him, I have an issue with this quote for this reason. And I talk about this in the book too. Comparing my behind the scenes to your highlights reel. Okay, that's an obvious inequity, right? Like you've got all your makeup on and you've created this perfect visual image on Pinterest or Instagram. And I am looking at this with my pajamas on and it's four o'clock in the afternoon, no makeup. My house is a mess. We have no idea what we're having for dinner, like all these things, right? Like that's, that's an obvious mismatch, right? I shouldn't do that. But here's where I struggle with that quote. What if your worst day is still better than my best day? I mean, friends, goodness gracious, I have a global audience. And I love the fact that I have listeners in India and Norway. We made the charts in Norway recently. New Zealand, we've made the charts there regularly. I I love the fact that I have a global audience. Friends, your best day could still be harder than someone's worst day. And so that advice doesn't necessarily help me stop comparing, does it? I think the real heart, the real message needs to be that we need to stop comparing for something other than just ourselves and our own, I don't know, sanity, if you will. Like, yes, we need to stop comparing for that reason. But there's a bigger reason we need to stop comparing. And in the book, I talk about the me reasons to stop comparing, right? Like it's not healthy for me to compare myself to you all the time. I stay obsessed there. You know, it can affect a marriage in a big way. Like I could do a whole episode on comparison in marriage and maybe I should, but because we can compare our marriage to other people's marriages, yes, but we can also compare ourselves with our spouse, right? I, I don't know about you, but in the early days of marriage and when I had young kids, I was angry with my husband a lot of the time because he would get to go away to work and he would get to go out and have a big person lunch, <laughs> like an adult lunch where he had adult conversation. And sometimes he'd even go to the gym, the nerve of the guy. And I would have been at home all day long filling sippy cups and eating peanut butter and jelly crusts because I didn't have time to stop and make myself something I would enjoy eating and watching Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood or whatever it was all day long. And I would just feel kind of angry comparing where I was with where he was. And that created tension in our marriage. So I talk about that in the book too. So there's lots of different ways that comparison hurts us. Those are me reasons, right? But I think that there's a bigger reason why we need to stop comparing. And this reason or these reasons, I call in the book the he reasons to stop comparing. And the biggest one of all, friends, is comparison is sin, right? There's a lot of different ways that it could be sin. I'm not saying every time you compare yourself to someone else, you're sinning. Please hear me in that. I do think part of this is is kind of like, I've heard this illustration used around lust before. It's kind of like the second thought rule or the bounce rule, right? Like you can't help but notice the attractive person, but then what you do next is kind of what matters most, right? So the next thing you do is it look at that person again and really like ruminate on how good looking they are and what it would be like to be with them. Okay, that's sin. But just looking the first time is not the sin. And I think it's the same way with comparison. The first time you notice, oh, she's got a better body than I do, or she looks really great today and I could barely make it out of the house with real clothes on, right? Like the first time you notice that and you compare yourself to her, I don't think you're sinning, friend, but it's what you do next. 
if you spend the whole rest of the service you're together or the meeting you're together, or the lunch you're together, if you spend the whole rest of that time, like kind of doing the matchup, like, well, she beat me in the how we look at this event today <laughs> arena, but I heard her say this thing about her kids. So I think I'm beating her in the mom arena. And, oh, it sounds like her husband, uh, they may have a better marriage than we do, but she didn't even know about this latest thing on the news. So I'm obviously smarter than she is. I mean, you guys, like, this is hard for me to say out loud (laughs) because it means that I'm admitting that I have done this, right? But I know you've done it too, right? We put ourselves in this matchup, this competition. And friends, I think that's when we're sinning. And you know, the beauty is that God knew this was going to be a problem for us. God is not surprised by this thing that we do, okay? But he also tells us that it's damaging, that it's dangerous, and that we need to stop, okay? You don't have to look further than the Ten Commandments to see that we shouldn't covet. And in the book I explain, I think a lot of people don't like to use the word covet or jealousy or um, envy because they're not sure which means which, And so in the book, I explain the difference. So covetousness is over material possessions normally, but I think in the realm of body image, we objectify each other so much that covetousness could actually be someone else's body part because we've almost dehumanized that person with a better body than we have. And we we can say things like, I want J-Lo's butt, or I want whomever models abs or whatever. And we can almost dehumanize them and covet just that body part. Okay. That's coveting. Uh, Another example is like, um, you know, I want my neighbor's new car. I want my neighbor's new home. I want my neighbor's kitchen remodel, like whatever it may be, that's coveting. Right. And then there's envy. And envy in my research I found is really more about I want what she has, and I kind of hate her for having it. And friends, I think that's when we start the spiral of trying to figure out what areas were better than she is so we can kind of puff ourselves up with pride, which is another sin related to comparison, right? But envy is like, Ugh, I hate you for being able to lose weight so quickly after you had the baby, or Ugh, I just, it's so frustrating that her metabolism is faster than mine is. And oh, friends, I've heard women speak this from the stage at women's meetings, you know, just like a joke, like, oh, and if you have a faster metabolism than me, I hate you. Like, oh, it makes me cringe. Do not say these things. But that's envy, friends. Like, it completely dismisses the fact that God has made us all differently. He's created us all with different purposes, right? But when we see someone else's life, And we have that, like, I wish I was like her. Ugh, I don't like her because I wish I was like her. Let me figure out what she's doing wrong so I can hate her a little bit. Right? That's envy. And it divides. In fact, there's um, scripture in Galatians that puts envy on the same list of sins as sexual orgies and witchcraft and all kinds of other really bad things where you're reading this list and you're like, oh, nope, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Envy? What? What is that doing there? (laughs) But it's there for a very important reason. Envy divides. Friends, envy splits churches. Envy kills community. Envy hurts the body of Christ. And that's why I don't think we can be cutesy cute about our comparison issues when there's really envy underneath. We have to be serious about rooting out envy. And friends, where that has to start is with us, right? And so every time I feel those thoughts bubble up where I'm feeling envious, I have to say, oh, God, please help me not to envy her. God, forgive me. I repent of my envy. Forgive me. Help me to carry on and love my sister well. Love my friend, my this woman that you have created, this precious other human being whom you have created and given a unique purpose that is different than mine. Help me to love her well and stop comparing myself to her and competing with her. And that's, that has to be the cry of our hearts, friends. Otherwise, this comparison thing is going to really harm us and those with whom we're comparing. 
So the last one is jealousy. And, you know, jealousy can be sin, but the scripture also tells us that God is a jealous God. And so sometimes there is a righteous kind of jealousy, right? Where if, uh, let's say your husband's assistant is paying too much attention to your husband and you see it and you feel it, that is a righteous jealousy. You have the right to protect your marriage. Your husband is yours. The two of you are one flesh. And so you have a justified reason to be like, hey, we got to take some action here. I don't like like how she's spending time with you or whatever the scenario may be. Okay. But that's different than envy. That's different than just hating the girl because she's skinny and cute and younger than you without there being an actual threat to your relationship. Okay. And then there's pride. And we already talked about this a little bit, friends, but a lot of times what happens with comparison is that we have to find ourselves in one of two places and they're both prideful, right? The place either has to be oh, at least I'm better than she is in this area, (laughs) right? Or at least I'm better than they are. At least I'm still the best in this arena, right? That's all pride. Those are prideful thoughts. Or we go to the other side of pride, which is self-loathing. And most people don't connect that these two things are both pride. But self-loathing is often like, I'm the worst. Ugh. Why didn't God give me any talents? Why didn't God give me any gifts? Why did God make me look this way? And friends, it's just me, me, me. Why me? Woe is me. God didn't know what he was doing when he made me. God has cheated me. I mean, really, that's what's underneath a lot of those statements. And again, friends, that's pride too. Because who are we to think that we know better than God? How our lives should look what we should look like, what we should be doing. I mean, that's a sobering thought, friends, but rewind it and play that one again if you need to hear it one more time. Who am I to say God did it wrong or God's gypped me, right? That's just all pride and we have to surrender it to. Friends, there's so much in these first couple chapters of this book. I couldn't possibly cover it all. But I really hope that you'll go grab a copy of The Burden of Better wherever you get your books, wherever Christian books are sold. It's at Walmart. I even saw it on eBay today, but don't buy it on eBay. They're charging way too much over there, but it made me laugh. Um, but, But go buy a copy of this book wherever books are sold. And I hope you'll start reading along with us. So the next book club episode will be the end of March. Okay, so you have a whole month to send me questions. And if it's questions from this episode, that's fine too. But send me questions. I also have this brand new fun little thing on the website. If you go to compare to you.me slash podcast, there's a link to this thing called Speak Pipe. And so if you're not really a typer, or don't really want to write out your question, you can audio record your question for me. So that will be super fun if you want to do that. It's called Speak Pipe. And it's right there. Um, scroll to the bottom of the compare to you.me slash podcast page, and you'll find the link for that if you want to leave me a question audibly. That would be so cool. But I hope you've enjoyed today's discussion about our ideals and about comparison and about the me reasons versus the he reasons to stop comparing. Friend, listen to this episode as much as you need to because we don't solve our comparison issues in a day, okay? Because you've listened to this episode, do not expect to be all better tomorrow and stop comparing, okay? It doesn't work like that. But I do believe it is possible to live a comparison-free life. And I'll tell you, friends, my struggle with comparison is one one thousandth of what it used to be. Yes, every once in a while I get on Instagram and I find someone to compare myself to and I spend about an hour in utter misery as I do that. But it's not nearly what it used to be. And I want the same for you. I want you to be able to live a comparison-free life. I know that's what God wants for you too. I know that's his heart for you. So I am praying right now that maybe this will be the start of that journey for you where you can let go of comparison and truly embrace who God has made you to be and what he has created you to do, what your purpose is in him. We'll talk more about this book next month. I hope you'll join us then. Until then, I've got a bunch of great stuff coming up for you in March. We're doing a brand new series on fears. Friends, we are going to talk about the fear of fat. That's going to hit home with some of you. The fear of bread. Yeah, that's a thing. And that's going to hit some home with some of you too. 
Uh, we're going to talk about the fear of what other people think, the fear of losing your health if you go off all the diets. Oh, friends, it's going to be good. So I've got a bunch of great episodes for you in March. I hope you'll listen along. And hey, will you tell your friends about this show? That is a great way you can bless me is to just tell friends because guess what? You know a woman or 10 who are struggling with body image and comparison. So share this episode if it feels like the least body related. Share this episode with her because I think she will Enjoy the freedom to know that she is not alone in these secret ways she struggles. Start living. And hey, if you're listening on the Edify podcast app, I'm happy to know you. And if you're not, hey, check out Edify. It's a great place to find all kinds of Christian podcasts compared to who is a super excited member of the Spark Media Network now available on the Edify app. So go to your Google Play Store, your Apple Store and grab that app today. Oh, hey there, before you go, if something from today's show blessed you, may I ask a huge favor, leave a review on your favorite platform. Seeing your five-star reviews is a huge encouragement to me. Not sure how to do it? You can go to compare to who.me slash podcast, scroll to the bottom, and you'll find all the information. And while you're at compare to who.me, check out some of the more than 500 articles on there about body image, comparison, all the things you're thinking about. Plus, you can take the free body image quiz. You can find out more about my books, or you can grab a time for a free 10 minute call to see if coaching is right for you. I'm so honored to be a part of your journey out of body image and comparison frustration, and I can't wait to hear how God is working to set you free.